the value of social distance can be viewed from different perspectives. I show you some of them. One perspective could be distance learning during the pandemic. It's one idea to talk about distance. Some of the people who are involved in democratic education talked about it. For example, Jakob Hecht, I remember in the last web IDEC 2020, he talked about how the pandemic had an effect on education and what's valuable about it. This is one way to look at distance, but I'm not going to do it today. It's not my perspective today on this subject. Another perspective could be social distance as a personal need. I don't know if you know this book from Susan Cain. It's called Quiet, and this one is a follow-up called Quiet Power. And she talks about introverts versus extroverts. People who are introvert tend to need more space and more social distance to blossom than extroverts. And this could be a valuable perspective to talk about the subjects, but it's also not the perspective I will take on today. It's another workshop maybe. And what I want to focus on is distance as a prerequisite for making decisions in a group. We all have in our schools meetings and there are different styles of how to do a democratic meeting. And I have some pictures for you. The first picture is from a movie and the movie is called, Inge, you know it? Yeah, it's called Wandering Schools and this picture is from the elementary school. Yes, and it's called School Circles, isn't it? The website, School Circles. School circles. Uh, it's one way how people can make decisions in, in a school. The second picture is taken in Summerhill. And I've been in Summerhill only once, and it has been for a festival which was called Freedom to Learn, Freedom to Learn Forum. And you see how in Summerhill a meeting is run. It's not the school meeting because the school wasn't in operation at the time, but it's a meeting which is run by a student of Summerhill, the girl here in the middle, and she runs the meeting and she deliberately runs it like she would run a meeting in school time. The third picture, it's actually from the school where I work. I've co-founded a democratic school in Berlin and we didn't know too much about the different styles you can have to run a meeting but we were influenced by the Sudbury Valley School. And the Sudbury Valley School has also a certain style on how to run a meeting. And we were more or less influenced by the Sudbury Valley School. Later, we were also influenced by other schools, for example, by Summerhill. There we have it. We have three different styles of how to run a meeting, a school meeting in a democratic school. I called a Sudbury style meeting, Summerhill style meeting and sociocratic style circles. I don't know much about the sociocratic style circles. Therefore, I put there some question marks. We will come to it. Let's start with the Sudbury style meeting left picture. Sudbury Valley school meetings are highly formalized. They use parliamentary procedures which are quite sophisticated, if they stick to it, I don't know, but if they stick to Robert's Rules of Order, this is a parliamentary procedures they follow, then it's quite sophisticated. Robert's Rules of Order is a framework on how to run a meeting. And if you do it like Robert's Rules of Order says, then the meeting is run very democratically. What I mean with this is that you have a chair, the chair has certain duties and powers, but it's very clear which duties and which powers the chair has. And it's very clear which rights each participant has. And the chair can't just decide, we will have a break right now. 
or we won't uh, discuss this question anymore or let's move on or something like this. He has to stick to the rules. And if the chair doesn't stick to the rules, there are mechanisms to force him to stick to the rules and even to remove him if it's necessary or her. That's what I mean if I say it's democratically run. And of course, the decisions are taken by majority vote. Okay, the next is Summerhill. At our school, at one time, we had a former student from Summerhill who has been a staff member at Summerhill for quite a while, a house parent. I think he has been a house parent at Summerhill. And then he came back to Berlin, where he came from. He's from Berlin. And he found out that there's a democratic school in Berlin. It's the school which I co-founded. And he applied. And he was a staff member for a while at our school. And he talked to us about how Summerhill meetings are run. And he wasn't very satisfied the way our meetings were run. And so he introduced some ideas from Summerhill. And that's why our meeting today is maybe a mixture from Subri and also Summerhill ideas. I could point you to some influences which are clearly from Summerhill and some influences uh, which are clearly from, from Subri Valley. I have only been once there in Summerhill and I only participated at these meetings run by this uh, girl. And I know what my colleague told me about the Summerhill meetings. And from all of that, I have the impression that the Summerhill meetings are not so much formalized, not so much as the Sudbury Valley meetings. They have some basic rules, but the most important rule they have, I think is the chair, the chair of the meeting has ultimate power. That's the rule. <laughs> the chair of the meeting has ultimate power. And uh, that's how the meetings are run. It's true. I have been there and I was impressed. I was impressed by this girl. I was impressed how these meetings are run. And there are certain things I liked very much about the Summerhill style. Maybe we can talk about it later. So the Summerhill meeting is chaired authoritatively. It's not authoritarian, <laughs> it's authoritatively. It means the chair has much power. And it depends on a good chair if the meeting is run in a good way. I think the chair has to have a very good ethics not to misuse his or her power. But if she doesn't misuse his or her power, it's, it's a powerful way to run a meeting. And if it comes to decisions, Summerhill also is taking decisions by majority vote. The third example is the sociocratic style. And as I said before, I don't know much about it. I don't know much about the formalization. There has been a talk at the last UDEC online conference a few months ago from a woman, I don't remember her name right now, but she gave a talk and she, be here. Yes, she demonstrated how sociocracy works and how they do it. And my impression was they probably have some formalization, maybe a strong formalization, I don't know. They have some procedures. I don't know what they have as a chair, if they have something like a chair. Yes, Inge. Uh yeah, you want to comment on that? Yeah, sure. It is. I think it's quite formalized. There's uh, um, there's a chair and there's um, uh, rules on how to run the meeting and what steps to take. And I think the most important things, to, maybe two things that I think are very important is that we there is a um, set of rules on how to discuss a topic. And it means that we we speak in in rounds so that everybody gets their turn. And um, um, those circles are, um, you know, some people will bring in the topic um, and then there's a round of questions to, to get um, the topic as clear as possibly can. Um, and then there's a round of um, where people can just 
know, tell the whole group um, how they feel about it, about the decision being made. And then there, of course, is the consent round. And um, sociocratic uh, decisions are not being made by majority of vote, but by consent, which means that um, um, it is really difficult to, um, to say no to uh, whatever somebody has brought into the meeting, because it, it, you can, it can only, you can only say I'm not consent when it, some, when it is something that is really bad for the school or if it's really dangerous or something like that. So if a student wants to paint the ceiling purple, that's not dangerous, that's not bad for the school. So he would probably get that through if he has a good plan on the finances and how to do it and with whom, which makes it really interesting and sometimes really difficult to figure out if, um, if a not consent is actually um, valid. Okay, uh, thank you, thank you. It's brilliant that we have you here. <laughs> I couldn't have uh, explained ah, this. You should watch the movie tomorrow, it's interesting. Yeah. 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 I will. So I had an interesting discussion with my colleague from Summerhill, not only me, but he was discussing it with our staff members and also students. And he said that our meeting, how we were on it, it's too slow. It's too bureaucratic, maybe too many rules. It's not interesting for children, not interesting enough for children. And we are discussing and deciding about subjects which are maybe too much management subjects, management mm -hmm. issues about money, for example, about whom to hire, all this kind. And he was talking about the summer meeting, which was quicker, more direct, more to the point, also more about the issues which really interest the children where I really have a say. And he meant primarily conflicts, for example, conflicts between the people, relationships, what went wrong the last days. And he said, children, they can talk about it. They understand it. It's important for them. And therefore, they show up and they want to be a part of it. And he criticized, for example, that in our meeting, the students didn't show up too often and there were too many adults uh, in the meeting and he didn't like it. Yeah, I guess that happens with us as well a bit. There's usually only a small group at the school meeting, but we have split the, um, these two things that you now mentioned, like all the, all the things that are about conflicts between people. Yes. They have a different setting. Yeah. That's a different meeting. There's a split in our school also. From the beginning, we have the school meeting and we have the school court. Yeah, yeah. We don't call it court it, yeah. because it's not, but we have a similar sort of thing. Yeah. yeah. And the main, the main objective there, I guess, is that we try to get people to uh, explain their view of the situation and others really learn to listen so that you can just, I don't know, you can just get a sense of how people um, are aware of, uh, of the situation in different ways. Yes. So just trying to understand each other better. Yes. I think what comes into play right here is the question of being close to each other and having a distance between people. When we started our school, we did it because we didn't know better. We just thought the Sudbury Valley model is fantastic. And we read the books and we thought this is the way to go. And I also read a lot about how to run a meeting and what's important about it. And mm -hmm. when I was confronted with this guy from Summerhill, I began to think about it. And one issue which came up is it's attractive if you are close to other people and if you are in a meeting and you are close to each other, but there's some value in being not so close to each other. And that's the subject of my talk. I just want to point 
to the value of distance in meetings. What's valuable about being in a social distance to each other in a meeting? And I think people don't understand the value of distance in this Sudbury style meeting. They don't understand the value of it. I think I, I do, because I think in the sociocratic style, uh, there's also uh, this distance created by the formalization of yes. how, we, how we talk to each other. Yes. Um, um, and one major rule is that when somebody is talking, you let them talk and you don't interfere. Um, which means that everybody can get his chance to talk and that, um, I don't know, they really learn to listen to each other and be patient. And sometimes it feels like, like maybe meetings might take a long time with all these rounds and questions. And, um, but I think in the end, it, is, it, is, it doesn't take so much time usually because people listen to each other and, and then you can just decide. Yeah. And so we had a, a little 11 year old boy. Our school is only a secondary school. So we have kids from 11 to 20. And we had an 11 year old boy who had just started maybe, I think he was in school, not even two weeks. And he proposed something that was very drastic, um, very drastic thing for our school. And he was really scared of, of to being in the meeting with all these older kids and, and adults that had been there so long. And you could just see on his face that he was so surprised that he was actually being listened to, even though nobody really knew him yet. That was really nice. And I think sometimes that distance that you create by formalizing yeah yeah actually makes it i guess that makes it better yeah 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 it's interesting it's interesting that you see it the same way and that maybe sociocratic circles also use distance as a means to get to better results yeah, I've never thought about it in this way, but I think that is actually what it does. Yeah. And I also think there is a, um, the context matters. So what's happening? What are the decisions that are, need to be made? What is the space? What do the people in this space require to be able to make the decisions that we need to make? So I think in some instances, I think there's, there, there's need to be flexible. There's there's flexibility because too much distance sometimes you get disconnected, but too little distance doesn't allow you to it equals group think right doesn't allow you to critically understand um, the situation or sort of understand y your feelings in how we're going to make this decision kind of thing. Mm. Yeah, I guess in this formalized formalized way of discussing things, you create a little bit of distance because you try to keep out the emotional side of things. Um, you know, and friendships doesn't, don't really matter, stuff like that. Or, um, and at the same time, it actually gets you really close. You feel yeah. connected to each other. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, I, I will go on. Um, I would like to have a look into a few rules of Robert's Rules of Order. I've put here the picture of Robert's Rules of Order and also the standard code of parliamentary procedure. There are several parliamentary authorities and the standard code of parliamentary procedure is a bit more modern. I do like it a bit more, but the most used parliamentary authority is Robert's Rules of Order. And we will have a look into a few of the rules. First of all, the procedure, how you get a motion voted upon is interesting. First of all, you have to get recognized. And Robert's Rules of Order is a bit strange. People have to stand up. They have to stand up. Mm. And if the chair calls you, 
then it's your turn and you can speak. And I think you keep standing up and you talk. And then if you are finished, you sit down and immediately there are some other people who are standing up because they want to talk. They are not allowed to stand up while somebody is still talking. That's the same as you said, Inge, they have to be quiet and listen. But as soon as the guy or the girl who has the floor sits down, the next one stands up. And sometimes it's several people standing up at the same time and the chair has to decide which one gets the floor. Mm -hmm. That's getting recognized. The second step is making a motion. That's just if you are recognized, you can state what you want to state. And the third step is seconding the motion. I don't want to go into detail too much here, but if a motion is to be debated upon, it has to be seconded by someone. It means somebody else has to say, yes, I want to have a debate on this motion also. Then the next step is stating the question, which is stating the motion. Uh, in this step, the chair restates what the motion is in exact the words which have been used by the one who made the motion. Mm -hmm. The fifth step is debating the motion. The sixth step is putting the question. If nobody wants to talk anymore about the motion, then the chair uh, is putting the question. That's the old fashioned expression, I think. It means he's calling the motion to a vote. Mm. And then the an announcement of the voting result. And we will come back to this stating the question, stating the motion. Why is the chair stating the motion again? It's just a detail. Normally, you don't look into these details, but I think it's an important detail. He's stating the question again. The chair is stating the motion again. We come back to it later. There's a smaller book about Robert's Rules of Order, and it explains how Robert's Rules of Order works. Now, I would like uh, you to open a page. It's a text, not very long, but I would like you to read, read it. So, and this except is from this smaller book. And uh, let's take a few minutes to read it, okay? Okay. It's two pages, I think. Yeah. Fine. Oh, Isabel is quick. She's done. <laughs> oh, I'm not so quick at <laughs> reading. Yeah, <clears throat> I'm not either. <laughs> English is not my first language. Mm, same here. <clears throat> mm. Okay. Are you done? No, almost, but that's okay. Go on. No, no, we wait. <laughs> I was just rereading something to see if I, if I understand correctly. Um, 
So can you clarify for me what this Robert's rules, where, where does that come from or? Yes, it's uh, the guy who wrote it, Henry M. Robert. Henry M. Robert is his name. He wrote this book because he had the impression that there are many organizations in US America, he's from the US, and all of these organizations have some rules on how to run their meetings, but all these rules are conflicting with each other and people are always not knowing which rules to apply. And so he thought, well, let's do some standard procedures. So that was his idea. Sure. Okay. And it developed over the years. Of course, he doesn't live anymore. And I think it's an organization who still continues to re-edit it. And uh. mm -hmm. Okay, what do you think about what you've read? What's your opinion? Are you asking me or are you asking somebody else or? Whoever wants to answer. Okay. <laughs> So that no. sounds just like Parliament yes. in here in yeah. in this region. Um, it also, which is a spin-off of Parliament in the UK. And yes. so, yeah. I, I, for me, when I've watched Parliament, and they, even though they do the through the chair, yeah, they are still deeply personal. <laughs> like they make personal attacks, yes, even yeah. though the church attempts to make, um, even though one person speaks and then everybody else waits, they talk during the time that they're waiting because one, the time limit for people to, to, to do their presentations is like in Jamaica, because I'm in Jamaica right now, it's 15 minutes, right? Um, and then the chair usually the speakers speak for longer than 15 minutes they go up to like an hour an hour and a half sometimes sometimes even longer depending on the the um the motion right and everybody else who's listening who's sitting in parliament is not paying attention to the person not not always depending on what's being said and they have already they have already these speeches that they make are not from today like they are written by speech writers kind of thing yeah so it, it, i see it i understand the pers the reason for doing it like these two things the debate the issues not personalities and they threw the chair but and they, and they one at a time speaking but I, I see it in action in Parliament and it doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't do what it was intended to do. Yeah. And mm -hmm. so then for me, it's like, it's having a rule for having a rule sake, which really doesn't make sense because if the spirit of the, of the rule is not held, then it's just like, what they would say, like, it, it doesn't make sense. It, 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 the point is mute it just doesn't work yeah so um I, I in theory completely agree in practice um at least in at the ministerial governmental level i don't see it working i i, I can see how it might work better um with community people who are interested in the the, the, the topics and the ideas and so on of of the community that directly affect their lives but I, on a large scale, it, I don't see it, see it working. And then also depending on the intent. Yeah. Thank you. It's true that these rules stem from the English Parliament. <laughs> okay. <laughs> the English Parliament was the source, I think, and the American Parliament, American Congress, they, they put together some rules from the English Parliament. They were still influenced by the English Parliament and they put together some rules. And Robert 
himself, he didn't do it for the legislative parliaments. He did do it for smaller organizations, but he still was probably influenced by the parliamentary procedures of the American Congress. That's true. So there's a lineage of influence which goes back to the English parliament. Mm. Well, what I, I think I am so, I am so happy again with our sociocratic uh, style of uh, doing the school meetings because somehow in, in the structure, um, you, you, can, you can't uh, discuss personalities. It has to be issues. There's not really any other way. Of course, people can make mistakes, but then they, uh, um, it's easy to point it out and, and get back to the, to the motion and the subject. And the thing about um, uh, doing everything through the chair. Yes. Oh, I, I, I think that is, for me, that would be way too distant. I guess I think <laughs> yeah. um, that creates a distance where um, maybe I don't know. Let's say you've put in a motion and I have questions or I have ideas about it or I I'm I might even be angry about something. I still have to deal with you, the person who actually put in the motion in the in the meeting. So if I only get to talk to the chair, then how can you and I actually meet somewhere in the middle or something or get to really understand what we're saying? So that feel for me, that feels really strange. Yeah, yeah. I can understand it. We don't do it at our school, this, uh, this strict formal way. Mm -hmm. But in this workshop, I would like to explore a bit what could be of value, even if you only talk to the chair. What is the idea behind it? Like Isabel said, maybe if people don't understand the idea and if they don't act in the spirit of these ideas, those rules don't help a lot. But if we understand the spirit, the idea behind it, maybe we can see what is valuable about it. And maybe uh, there's a point. We should think about it and maybe implement it or not implement it. But I would like to explore it a bit more. Sure. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, let's see what happens if we have a meeting which is run like Robert's Rules of Order says. We have some people who are sitting there in front of the people. There's a chair in the middle, this great ellipse. It's just the floor. And somebody wants to state a motion and is recognized and states a motion. And now the chair restates the same motion. And what I think what is important about it is that in this moment, it's not the motion of the mover anymore. The person who did the motion doesn't own the motion anymore. Ah, oh, okay, understood. Mm -hmm. I think that's the point. Well, mm. Why would you want that? Uh, we will see it, we will see okay. it. Now the chair states the motion and he puts it on the floor. If the chair restates the motion, it's like to put it in front of all the people. This is a motion we are talking about right now. And the person who stated the motion in the first place, he has the opportunity to explain his motion. It's a privilege that he has the right to speak first. After that, there are different people who talk about this motion and maybe criticize it, maybe amend it, maybe support it. And with each statement from other participants, 
the motion itself changes a bit, not necessarily in a formal way. If you want to change a motion formally, you have to amend it. And it's a strict procedure how to amend a motion. But still, you are giving something, some idea to the original motion. And this colors the first motion. Mm -hmm. And at one point, nobody has anything to add anymore. People have talked about this motion. Maybe this motion got formally amended and there's no one who seeks the floor anymore. Then the chair states the question, puts it to a vote. And in the moment he puts it to a vote, he elevates it. And people can look at it from different angles and then there will be the vote. And some of them will say yes, which strangely enough, it's, I think it's old fashioned, it's I in Robert's Rules of Order. And some of them say no. And I think the, the idea of distancing the motion from the people is that you can work on the motion. It's like a sculpture. Uh, and, and working on a motion can also mean, um, I don't know the English words, you, ha you have a hammer and you have something, I don't know what it's called. Can, can somebody help me, Isabel? <laughs> I know the Dutch word, but... Yeah. <laughs> so I'm doing this. Chisel. 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 Yeah, that's Chisel. the sculpting. Yeah. yeah, okay. If I have an idea, a motion, people start to work on it with a hammer and a sizzle. And if people are too much identified with their own motion, it will hurt them. Mm -hmm. As the whole idea is put up the motion and let go of it. It's not your motion. You stated the motion first, but then let go the motion it doesn't belong to you anymore and we as a group we will work on it and we will if necessary we will work hard on it and we don't want you to be hurt so please don't identify yourself with your own motion don't identify yourself with your own ideas the ideas that come through you are not your own ideas. Ideas don't belong to you. Oh, I find that difficult. I understand what you're saying, but I find that difficult. Why? Because <laughs> if I want to be a, a concert pianist, and I want, therefore, I want a piano in the school, then how can I just let that go? That is intrinsic motivation. I want this piano in the school because I need to play it. How can I just let it go and say, ah, oh, we'll see if it happens or not. That's true. I don't have an immediate answer to you, uh, Inge. You brought in a specific example from a school. What I like about this idea is that people are working on the ideas and not, uh -huh. so, much, not so much on their own interests. I think we need some very good ideas if we want to solve some of the pressing problems worldwide, maybe, but also in our nations and maybe also in our schools. If we want to solve some of the pressing problems, we need the best ideas. And to get the best ideas, I think we have to work on them hard. And in order to be able to work on ideas hard, I think it's helpful if people don't identify themselves too much with them. Because if they are identified with their own ideas, maybe they get hurt, or at least they, they feel hurt. And I think the idea of distance is put your idea in the room and we will have a structure, we will have a culture to help you not to identify too much with the idea. 
to put the idea in the middle and to work on it, to work on it hard and maybe even destroy it because it's not a good idea. I think that's important. It's important that we have a culture where we can work on ideas and where we can also criticize ideas and even destroy ideas if we think they are not helpful. And it's difficult to do it if people are identified with their own ideas. And I think that's the idea behind such a sophisticated framework like Robert's Rules of Order, where you only talk to the president, where the president restates your motion. And if the motion is stated by the president, you can't even take it back anymore. It's not your motion anymore. It's not your idea. We are working on some ideas here. That's the idea behind distancing yourself from other people in a meeting and distancing yourself even from the ideas which get to be expressed through you. I think it's very interesting, um, but I wonder, it, like the picture that we are looking at right now on this on, on your presentation. Yes. Um, for starters, it doesn't really look like um, uh, equal because there's like this chair, and then yes. there's the rest. <laughs> um, so that's I have a problem with that. Um, but also, if if then the chair has restated the motion, how, how is this being discussed? Is that is that just you listen to the to the people that have the loudest voice? No, no. Or are bravest? Or no, no, no. Um, it's a picture we had uh, before. Maybe I can can go back a little bit. There's this procedure how to discuss a motion, okay? Debating the motion, okay. I didn't say much about debating the motion, but um, if a motion is debated, it's one after another. And yeah, you said something about then people stand up. Yeah, they stand they up. They want to say something. Yeah, okay. yeah, they stand up. They can raise their hand also, but uh, in the traditional, most traditional old fashioned way, they stand up. Yeah, okay, understood. Hmm. I think that's the value about such an approach that it's not so much about the people. I think that's misunderstood. It's not so much about the people. It's not so much about that people feel well. There's something more important and more important are, are the ideas. Igna? Yeah. Um, what Igna was, I, I get what she's trying to say um, in terms of it's, it's too distancing in some instances, especially with the example that she gave about the piano. Um, I want a piano in the school. And that's what I was saying at the beginning. It's really the different models for me can work in different for different situations and different types of situations mm -hmm. so if you want to dig a hole um to plant a, a, a seed you're not going to use a big backhoe tractor right because it's not going to be make sense to use that it just it's the wrong tool you can use your fingers or you can use a little trowel, like a shovel, a small one, a handheld one to be able to dig, dig that hole. If you want to plant, repot a, a, a tree or a plant that you, that's been growing for a few years and it's, you know, maybe your size, you might use a shovel, like a long handed shovel, you know what I mean? And, and, and so for me, these tools, Robert's Rules of Order, the... Um, Sudbury, mo Sudbury model, the Summerhill model of having decision making. Meetings require, are useful for different types of decisions. Yeah. So for the person who wants to make, have a piano because it's, they want to be a pianist, then that is a very specific issue. You can broaden it to what is our approach to, what's our policy about music or specific, like specialized, specialized sort of careers? What is our policy for that? And that can be brought to the room as, as an example of 
you know what I mean? So Robert's rule of order might be able to work better for a larger, a larger, more, more sort of organizing policy, if you want to call it that, as opposed to the the specific individual wants and needs, painting the, the ceiling purple, um, getting a piano for to be able to do that kind of thing. So I feel like as I said earlier, the, the amount of flexibility for me is important because the context needs to be taken into consideration when making a decision. Yeah, I totally agree. Yeah, I think those three models might be three different tools on how to take decisions in specific circumstances. And the only goal for me for this talk was to point to why being distant, very distant, only talking to the president and naming him Mr. President, <laughs> this is distancing yourself extremely from the people. And the point I wanted to make is to show that there's a reason why it might be a good idea in certain circumstances. The circumstances in which this might be a good idea is if you want to work on ideas. And if it's vitally important that these ideas are solid. You mean how, how people then sort of build together on the motion? Yeah, yeah. Let's take a big question. How do we want to go about climate change? Oh. Yeah, it's a big question. Yeah. So what do we want? Do we want to feel good with each other and everybody is agreeing that everybody has been hurt long enough and nobody is opposing anything? Or do we want to have the best ideas? Because we need them. and work on these ideas and attack ideas if we find they are not good enough. But I don't, hmm, I don't really understand why you want people to disconnect from their emotions. I don't think I want them to disconnect from their emotions, but that they don't identify too much. Hello, could I, I don't know. Yes, please. Yes. Sotirios. Hi. Hi to you, Sotirios. Yes. You are from? <laughs> from Greece. Apparently, I guess from my name. <laughs> you guessed. Mm -hmm. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you as well. Uh, um, I, I listen to you uh, all this time. It's a, it's very interesting. And if I if I feel like. Uh, uh, what you are saying, uh, if I understand it, uh, is uh, like uh, if you get co if you personify like the, the idea, you say this is my idea. Yeah. Uh, then you have to defend it too much, even if yeah. it's wrong. Yes. And then you will not get to the best idea, as you say, yes. because the other also will have an idea, will defend it, it will be like blocks in a meeting. So you are, you are not ready, you are not free to reach to the best uh, result. Yes. If I understood well, that, that, uh, that's what I wanted to say. Uh, and thank you, it's a nice approach. Uh, I'm, I'm trying to understand uh, yeah. correctly. Are you, am I understanding it right? If I think you are saying, I don't know. I'm, I don't think I understand what you just said. Ah, me, yes. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, maybe it's my accent. It's uh, Greek. No, no, no. <laughs> I understand. I can, I can uh, understand your ah, English. Okay. okay. But I'm Thank not you. quite sure if I understand. Uh, yes, or... I mean, uh, uh, like when I come in the room and, and I say, uh, we should paint uh, the room uh, black. I don't know. Let's say a simple uh, issue. <laughs> And mm -hmm. somebody else comes and says we should play it, uh, paint it uh, red. 
and the third uh, yellow. So if we, if we all think we have the best solution for this uh, issue already, maybe we will not reach to the best, uh, to the best uh, idea for, for the color of the room. Mm -hmm. That's what I want to say. Uh, that's what I understand from this uh, perspective. I like it, and that's how I, I understand it. Uh, we think maybe we should think what will affect our emotions. We should discuss about it, not personally how I feel better with which color. What affects mostly the people's uh, emotions in a positive way, which color? Maybe we should search this to see. Maybe according to the climate of the area, the city we live, what is the best color through the, throughout the year? Like, I don't know. Um, maybe one goal should, should be another color, where goes the sun? Maybe another goal that should be another color. Maybe we should search all these aspects. This is more important to discuss around uh, the issue and see how we can reach to the uh, best idea. Uh, what determines what is the best idea than to go in, in, in the room and say, I like it black, let's do it black. Like, and try to, because I like it, and this is what I, I would like to have, uh, to support it with, maybe with false arguments also. It's uh, like, because I said it, and it has to be done my way. That, that's how I understand it. I don't know if I help you, if I, uh, if I help you in, uh, see my... <laughs> I don't know, I'm, I'm a little confused at the moment. Okay. <laughs> uh, no, and no, I'm sorry. thinking really hard about Henning's uh, uh, suggestion about um, people not being identified to their own ideas too much. And I'm wondering, Henning, can I, can I maybe still... I think I can do this in a minute and a half. Um, to tell you how we do this in, in the sociocratic way and how we then shape motions, because that okay. might be interesting. Yeah, okay, go ahead. Is that okay? Yeah. Um, since I've just drawn this small picture, can you see this? Sort yes, of. yes, sort of. So we sit around the table, all adults and, and students alike. And somebody will have a motion. Motion, motion is there. Um, we, of course, we have a chair that can be a student, an adult, anyone. It will be different. Somebody every week, which is really great learning stuff as well for students to chair meetings. Um, it does, and does everybody has to chair once? No, of course not. Only if you want to. Okay. <laughs> yeah. And some, some students really want to learn and they get very good at it too. And some would never ever want to, but that's okay. Um, so then there's a motion and we talk, I've written it down somewhere, we talk in circles. And these circles are, we ask, first we ask questions about the motion so that everybody gets um, the best interpretation of what it is about. Yes. Can hardly read yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, I can read it. Yes. Question. <laughs> uh, but the person that uh, has done the motion cannot speak until round two, and then he can answer all the questions, or he or she. Then there's another round with where everybody can actually say what they think about it, so they give their opinion. And then the fourth. A point is where the chair asks the person who, uh, who whose motion it is if he wants to change anything about it. So, you know, you had a motion about a piano, bringing a piano into the school, and you get all these kinds of questions. What does it cost? Where you want to put it? Whatever. And then, so then somebody can can maybe change the motion a little bit. And then there is the consent round. And if, if somebody says, I'm not consent, I do not want this because I think it's bad for the school or whatever, that is the moment when the motion sort of goes over to that person. 
and uh, then 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 we first figure out if that not consent is actually valid. And if it is valid, then that person has to sort of come up with a new idea about this motion. And sometimes that means that the whole thing just goes off the table and comes back next week. And sometimes there is a new idea during the same meeting and we have another consent round. And um, I really like what you said, Henning, about, about this building thing up, uh, about ideas. Yeah. But what, what we do is we decide this week because you know there's money for the piano and no, but there's no problem with it. So the piano is going to be there. And if I then maybe two weeks later have a problem with the place where the piano is put, then I can just put in another motion. So nothing is ever set into stone and we can just, you can always put in a new motion to change things again. Yeah. That was probably not a minute and a half. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, no problem. Uh, I'm, I'm done with my presentation anyway. So we, I stop uh, screen sharing. And what I, what I really, I think the most interesting question for me today is, is this question about this difference between being not so identified with your own ideas and the intrinsic motivation that is what we are all about, right? In democratic ed education. Yeah, it's an interesting question. Maybe we have to make, um we have to differentiate between different motions. What you said about the piano, it's, it's an interest of one person. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's a need of one person. And maybe that is not the same as an idea. When I think about these Robert's rules of order and why is it the way it is, and so I think of ideas which are solving problems which are pressing maybe. And therefore, I had this example of uh, the climate change. We need the best ideas. How do we uh, get the best ideas? Best ideas, we will get them if someone puts forward some idea. Mm -hmm. Agreed. And, and the others crush on it and, and mold it and, uh, and work on it. And in order that this molding on it, this is working on it is not hurting the person mm. there needs to be some uh, some detachment you know that's the idea i i see and mm. i think we need something like this because we need the best ideas i think it's not enough no but but don't you think you cannot get the best idea on this one day on which one uh, today, like um, um, climate change, somebody puts in a motion to expel all plastics from school, which is a good idea. It might not be the best idea. It's not this, the only idea that would work, but it's a good idea. So that motion gets accepted and we start working on expelling all plastics. And then a few weeks later, you have a, an idea to make this even better. So there's a next motion for a difference to, to change it a little bit or to expand what we're doing. Yeah. I think that is the way it works with us. So we just, we keep building on things. Yeah, 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 yeah. We too. <laughs> we, don't, we don't have to do, we don't have to find the perfect solution in this one meeting. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Uh, that's true for most uh, decisions, but I'm not sure if it's true for all decisions. No, probably not. Of course not. <laughs> there are some decisions you can't take back. Wow, oh, yeah, true. Anyway, I don't claim that this is the way to go for the schools. <laughs> I don't oh. claim that uh, there's something like the best way to take decisions in a group. I just wanted to explore why distancing yourself from other people 
and from your own ideas could be a good thing. <laughs> yeah, Bob, is, I think it's a very interesting topic. Yep, so do I, and uh, thanks for sharing. I'm going to, um, it was really, it, it helped me think through some of, I'm interested in process and developing processes for how we gather and how we meet and so on um, based on the culture that I'm in. Yeah. So based on what we know, what we do in informal spaces, um, what that looks like and how do we articulate that into sort of a, a, a process? Like how do we how do we name the process? It's sort of a naming ex experience I'm trying to sort of articulate. Um, and just hearing how you sort of broke down something that I've been acutely aware of for a while was helpful in helping me think through that naming process. And so thank you. Thank you yeah. for your time and energy. I'm gonna, I'm gonna go. Thank but you for I being here, Isabel. I did appreciate um, your talk and your presentation. Thank you. And thank you, Inge, for being here. It was very helpful that you could explain security. And I will watch the film either tomorrow or I will watch it on my own, maybe. And uh, goodbye, Sotirius. Thank you. Thank you. It was very, very nice. We see you somewhere. In the future. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> See you soon. Next year in uh, Summerhill. Definitely. Yeah, great. <laughs> the best. Bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. <laughs>